on Sunday uh, we had finished here the PVT diagram. Normally people say PV diagram uh, because temperature is considered as fixed. But if you vary the temperature also then you can call it PVT diagram. So for one fixed temperature we can see that if we plot log of P as a versus log of V. Here P means the pressure that was used for the wear test or the friction test and V means the velocity that was used for the test, travelogical test. And this envelope or this region basically indicates that within this region the material is able to take that kind of pressure and velocity. It doesn't tell us exactly what is the friction or what is the wear rate but given a, a limit that uh, the wear rate for example for different application if the wear rate can be within the for example minus 7 in terms of millimeter cube per newton meter specific wear rate so this may be my uh, our limit that our materials should not cross um, specific wear rate of this. That means it should not be 10th power minus 6. So that means within this range the material can survive. It does not go into catastrophic failure. This is all it means. Uh, <clears throat> So the higher the limit, the better the material. So if, if another material can give this much limit, okay, that means this new material is able to take uh, higher pressure, higher load and, and higher uh, velocity. So therefore this material is better, this bearing material is better than the previous one. So this is how we can push the envelope here. So if we improve the material more and more then we can push this envelope further and which is better for our bearing application. This is how the PV diagram can be used and as I said before that either we can generate PV diagram in terms of the wear so uh, wear coefficient we can measure or in terms of friction whichever uh, our application demands and as the temperature will be increased let's say if we increase the temperature again this envelope will go down at higher temperature we expect that the material will not perform as well as at a lower temperature so basically this envelope will go down as we increase the temperature. So there is a temperature effect as well. So this PV diagram is a very useful one uh, both for dry bearings as well as lubricated bearing. So it can be applied for dry as well as lubricated. So it tells us whether the material is capable of uh, handling this kind of pressure and load, uh, pressure and the velocity. So the units of the PV limit can be, um, you can decide, you can use pressure in megapascal or, or other forms. So this is one way of putting the PV number. And here you can see that the materials we have got, the highest one is polyimide, filled polyimide means the composite of polyimide. So this indicates that among given these bearing materials, these are all polymeric materials <coughs> mostly, uh, polyimides, the filled polyimides are the best in terms of taking higher pressure and higher velocity. <coughs> It also gives us what will be the maximum speed it can take up to because beyond certain maximum speed there may be some catastrophic failure of the material. 
in general we will find that the filled polymers are better so for example if you take acetal so pure acetal is 0.1 but filled acetal is 0.28 now here we don't see what are the fillers so this is still unknown so in a proper information um, you should be provided with what the fillers are it could be let's say carbon fiber or glass fiber or some other particles so there can be many different types of uh, filled materials graphite is also another uh, materials which is filled in polymers so similarly for PTFE pure PTFE is has got very low PV limit that means it is not suitable for um, most of the applications but once it is filled the PV limit can go um, many orders of magnitude higher phenolics are another type of polymers these are thermosets again pure phenolics are not good but filled phenolics are better so along with PV value we should also look at the maximum pressure and the maximum speed that it can take so for example PTFE fabric we see it can take up to 400 uh, mega Newton per meter square <coughs> uh, so these are an other types of information that are necessary for us to make the selection of the bearing so another import, important requirement is the estimated life of the bearing life of a bearing is limited by two modes fatigue and wear so as we have seen before that for ro rolling element type of bearings fatigue is very important and bearings where there is no rolling elements it's sliding mostly sliding where wear is more important but even in the rolling case there will be some um, sliding uh, slip and sliding so therefore wear will be important <coughs> and surface fatigue will um, show itself as fatigue wear so what will be the life of the bearing uh, is very very important because um, you will see that many of the most of the machines failures are related to bearings because the bearings take all the loads and it also takes the vibrations all the fluctuations in the load and the vibration so therefore the failure will initiate at the bearing points rolling bearings and to some extent fluid film bearings are limited by fatigue so as I said the fatigue is important in these two cases dry and semi lubricated bearings are limited by wear which itself is a factor of temperature environment and contamination so when you are using a dry or semi lubricated bearing then you should find out what will be the wear coefficient because here we are talking about purely wear <coughs> whereas for rolling element bearings or even for fluid film bearings we should talk about fatigue life that means the cracks will initiate and grow uh, until a, a pit is formed and then the wear will take place by third body uh, wear <coughs> so the life of the bearing is is very important and then lubrication type of lubricant and the amount of lubricants are key to performance of the bearings so as we have um, studied um, before that without lubricant the bearings will not perform at all so and the lubricant is not just one component or just the base oil but it has got base oil plus many additives 
So the type of lubricant and the amount of lubricants are key to performing uh, key to performance of the bearings. So it is very very important that we should select the lubricant which has got sufficient amount of additives so that it can take care of the boundary lubrication and the mixed lubrication cases as well as it should have other things like um, um, protecting the oil from uh, too much of oxidation so antioxidants anti -cor uh, corrosion uh, elements all these kind of additives should be there so which means that if the lubricant is not good or not appropriate for your application doesn't matter how good bearing you have selected it is bound to fail it is bound to fail very very soon so this is important so it doesn't matter what material you have used very high hardness steel uh, or not doesn't matter because lubricant will decide the life of the bearing dry and semi lubricated requires no or very least amount of lubricant because by nature the dry um, bearings have some solid lubricants inside so that means the solid lubricant will provide the low friction characteristics and in semi lubricated we have some amount of oil or grease lubricated surface so therefore this will take care of the um, the friction roller bearings require minimum amount of lubricant few drops to one time grease so although we know that roller uh, rolling element bearings will uh, show low coefficient of friction because uh, the rolling friction is low less uh, but still it requires uh, lubrication although it may be only little bit of lubricant but still the lubricant is necessary because uh, even in rolling element bearing there will be some sliding or slip going on then oil film bearings require the maximum amount of lubricant so this is one of the uh, problem or demerit of oil film uh, bearings is that they require lot of lubricant because ultimately the um, the shaft has to float basically on a film of lubricant so the feed rate depends upon bearing length width clearance and surface velocity so the feed rates can be quite high in some cases depends on the application um, so it requires a lot of uh, lubricant and that's why you see for automotive engines we need to replace we need to add keep adding uh, lubricants removing the old one and keep adding the new ones uh, so that the lubricant remains good um, in terms of cleanliness and also in terms of its chemistry because the chemistry also will degrade with time Sir, how do we decide the amount of lubrication uh, based on the size or is there any ratio to decide the sufficient amount of lubrication? Um, yeah, it can be calculated. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, we will uh, go through the uh, Reynolds uh, equation and the derivation on how to calculate the quantity of the lubricant. <coughs> okay. Yeah. But also there is another aspect to it. Uh, the lubricant also provides uh, a cooling effect uh, and by circulation. So therefore, a higher amount of lubricant may not uh, be bad idea because you you also want to cool the surface, remove the temperature there. But we can calculate the minimum requirement. But obviously, the amount of lubricant should be more than the minimum so that you can, uh, there will be some losses, uh, uh, leakage, side leakage, and some losses of the lubricants as well. Then uh, for the bearing uh, selection, space requirement is another thing. So dry and semi-lubricated bearings require the least space. So if there, are, there is a space um, issue, then we should go for dry and semi-lubricated 
bearings um, oil film bearings also require less space as they are compact in radial and axial dimension additional space is needed to accommodate seals and feed and drain passages so although the bearing space may be minimum but we also need some space for the feeding and the drainage of the lubricant continuous drainage of the lubricant so the whole um, bearing will require a kind of system lubrication system roller bearing requires large space so outside diameter about one one and a half to three times the bore diameter and the axial dimension um, can be one fifth to half of the shaft diameter yeah so for example axial dimension this one and the outside diameter is this one so in general dry and semi lubricated bearings will be preferred if we can manage um, in terms of friction and wear another important requirement for uh, bearings is the environmental conditions so under what kind of conditions um, the bearings will be running so for example temperature range and whether there is will be moisture or dirt and corrosive conditions so in general we we have to provide a proper seal so that we can seal the bearing from outside outside dirt and moisture and any kind of corrosive uh, elements because in the presence of uh, these outside agents like uh, dirt and moisture the bearing cannot perform uh, but in terms of temperature we can only do some cooling of the bearing fluid film bearings are limited in the temperature range minus 22 150 degrees celsius um, because many of the uh, lubricants will become very viscous beyond uh, a temperature lower than minus 20 degree celsius so with very high viscosity you cannot run the bearing and at higher temperature like 150 or more than 150 um, the basically the degradation of the lubricant will start so even for the <coughs> ic engine application the temperature can go up to 180 degree celsius in this range so for very high temperature application we may not be able to use fluid film bearings because of the limitation of the of the oil or lubricant synthetic oils and greases with Uh, tool steels and ceramic bearings are better adaptable uh, so synthetic oils have got higher temperature tolerance so so therefore synthetic oils are preferred nowadays although it is uh, more expensive it is almost like four times more expensive than the normal hydrocarbon or petroleum based uh, lubricating oils rolling bearings are better resistant to many environmental conditions because double sealed or double shielded enclosures so all depends on the sealing how how well the uh, the lubricant uh, the bearing has been sealed so so that it can be protected from uh, any outside um, environment then uh, final requirement will be the economics uh, the first cost the maintenance and replacement so because bearings form a very important part of the total overall cost of the machine and uh, in most of the cases the bearings are replaced quite frequently because failure initiates at the bearings so they are continuously replaced and therefore they are a 
running cost. So cost varies in this order. Dry and semi lubricated bearings have the least cost compared to uh, oil film plane bearings, ball bearings, oil film bearings with high load and speed conditions. So normally for uh, um, very simple application we, we will go for dry and semi lubricated because this is uh, preferred from many aspects. As uh, the requirements become more stringent or severe then we go for oil film plane bearings going for ball bearings and so on. Mass produced oil film bearings also tend to be cheaper. Okay, so again um, how we produce the bearings, the bearings are mass produced in that case the cost can be cheaper but the competition is very very high in this area so so different uh, bearing com companies are competing for uh, the market uh, within a very very small uh, uh, profit so so it is a very very competitive uh, market as well so our selection of the bearing will also depend upon final cost so for example if the cost is too high we may go for bearing which can give us lower cost maintenance and life oil film bearings would require oil change and change of filter other types of bearings are generally designed to work maintenance free until the whole life cycle so the cost is not just the initial cost or first cost but maintenance cost and then replacement cost so you have to add them all together in order to find the total cost for the whole life of the bearing or running of the machine and based on this based on that we have to decide which type of bearing we should go for so uh, in this we have gone through many uh, different uh, requirements important requirements to be considered for bearing selection so bearing selection is not only the load and speed requirement or friction and wear requirement but there are many many other aspects to it which we have gone through and uh, we have to um, at one point or the other we have to decide how we what kind of bearing um, we should be using now the next aspect of uh, travelogical systems design will be the nature of surfaces because all along we have been talking about uh, surfaces because travelogy is entirely a surface uh, surface phenomenon or surface property of solids so but there are many other properties of the surfaces which will influence travelogy uh, so that means two surfaces may not be exactly the same even though they have been produced the same way for example we know that let's say we have got a steel surface so two steel surfaces which were produced by the same process may not be the same in terms of their surface properties and therefore the travelogical properties will also change so what are the uh, features of a surface? What are the nature of surfaces that we should consider for tribology? So the first one is surface roughness and texture. Surface properties or nature of surfaces is important not only for tribology, for many other things. You know, for example, uh, coating, application of coating. Coating technology requires uh, proper preparation of the surface. You know, similarly, in the painting industry, surface preparation is very, very important. Uh, <clears throat> there can be some other, other uh, applications, for example, biological application. Biological application also requires uh, the surfaces to have certain properties. So similarly, for tribology, we have to consider 
all aspects of the surface. So first is roughness and the texture. So when we talk about roughness, uh, there are different levels of roughness. For example, it can be a macro scale or it can be micron scale or it can be even nano scale. So depending upon the application, we can see what kind of um, roughness we need. So for example, uh, it is not that we always require low surface roughness but we need the optimum surface roughness. So for example, in the cylinder liner of IC engine, certain type of surface roughness and texture is given. And this is mainly given for better tribological properties. So that means the cylinder liner should not be too smooth or too rough and it should have certain type of texture. So texture basically includes many things uh, inclu including the roughness. So it, texture is the overall feature of the surface. Uh, other application for example magnetic hard disks. So magnetic hard disks uh, contain surface roughness in the range of angstrom level. So atomically smooth surface is used for making magnetic hard disk because this also has got tribological um, issues related. So in this case we go for extremely smooth surface and the reason is not only the tribology but also some other uh, properties like magnetic properties requirement. So it is not always that we go for very smooth but rather we want to have an optimum level of surface roughness and the texture. And all engineering system will, uh, all engineering manufacturing system will produce certain type of surface feature or roughness and texture. Okay. We cannot avoid that. So always there will be some sort of feature. The second aspect will be for the surface, surface energy. So every surface has got some energy associated with it which is also known as surface free energy. Sometimes this is also defined as work of adhesion. So, for example, if there are two surfaces in contact with each other and if we separate them uh, so that <clears throat> Initially, there was no, um, here there was one interface, interface between solid 1 and solid 2 or it can be same, same solid, solid 1 and solid 1. So when we separate them together, then now we have created two surfaces. <clears throat> two fresh surfaces we have created. One is on this side, another is on this side. So, so the amount of work done to separate these two surfaces will be the work of adhesion. That means once these new surfaces have been created, how much energy is associated with these two so the amount of energy that we have to put in to separate them is proportional to the amount of energy that will be created on the surface, on the free surface. Surface free energy is another important aspect of uh, in tribology. And in fact, it is a very, very important aspect because high surface free energy, surface energy is sometimes given as gamma s. So since work of addition creates two surfaces, so this will be equal to 2 gamma s if they are same materials. So the surface free energy of a solid is very very important because higher surface free energy is associated with its reactivity. 
means the atoms and molecules on the surface are not fully satisfied and they are prone to uh, make physical bonds or chemical bonds with other elements present. So for example if this surface has got uh, gamma s which is high then all the atoms which are on this surface they are not fully satisfied because they have free free bonds on the top surface so therefore if there is any any chemical species here for example if h2o is there in the vapor or o2 is there oxygen they they are prone to react with them and therefore they will form some another uh, chemical species so this is what happens when the surface free energy is high for the surface so this kind of property is good for adhesion but this is not good for uh, friction so good for adhesion but not good for friction friction will be high if surface free energy is high and this is the reason why most of the metals give you high coefficient of friction because they tend to have very high surface free energy and uh, some surfaces have got low surface energy you know any surface which has got low surface energy sir low energy surfaces no sir not sure okay so normally metals are associated with high surface energy metals and ceramics but many of the polymers have low surface energy but not all polymers so for example if you have PTFE surface PTFE surface and also polyethylene surface they they have low surface energy <clears throat> and that's why you will see that they provide low coefficient of friction so surface free energy is, is extremely important or uh, surface energy is extremely important for deciding the friction part um, but for some other application high surface energy is good you know like uh, if you are going for adhesion or coating application uh, high surface energy is good but for tribological application generally we require low surface energy but even in tribology there can be some situation where high surface energy might be helpful which is when you have got lubricant and if this surface has got high um, gamma s then this surface has got more affinity to these lubricant molecules and the lubricant molecules can form a better boundary layer because of high surface energy so in this case this boundary layer will protect the surface from wear <coughs> and also provide low coefficient of friction so so in this kind of situation we may prefer high surface free energy but in general we require low surface free energy for most of the uh, bearing applications another important we we have already considered hardness many times this is also a surface property and hardness will decide the wear resistance <coughs> So high hardness is associated with high wear resistance of the surface. So again it is not just the hardness because hardness is one factor. There can be other properties which are also important like a toughness of the material. But in general we will go for high hardness for most of the bearing application as well as for uh, tool applications another nature of surfaces will be the contamination organic or inorganic so as we have seen in that uh, the vacuum um, experiment that when 
when a, a, a tribo test was conducted you know this tribo test was conducted inside a vacuum chamber so as as we um, make the vacuum friction coefficient starts rising sli slightly but when we heated the specimen here the coefficient of friction rose quite considerably and this rise in the coefficient of friction was associated with removal of the contaminants so that means initially the surfaces had lot of contaminants and therefore coefficient of friction was low but as soon as we heated the specimen so that means along with vacuum we heated the specimen uh, <coughs> the contaminants actually got removed because of heating and therefore the coefficient of friction rose considerably so contaminants have got very strong effect and in fact many times when we measure the friction of a solid it is the friction of the contaminant rather than of the solid so both organic and inorganic con contaminants can be present organic contaminants can be for example hydrocarbons uh, it can be some oil or grease which are present in the industrial environment <coughs> if even a monolayer of of contaminant organic contaminant can affect the coefficient of friction and wear so much so monolayer means basically a single layer so that means this is the solid surface and the molecules are attached to this surface single molecule so these are individual molecules but the thickness of this one is only single there is no further further layer so this is known as monolayer so even a monolayer of organic contaminants can affect the surface inorganic can be uh, for example oxides or dust dust particles very very fine dust particles then other kinds of surface features or nature of surfaces are uh, irregularities in terms of crystallographic uh, planes so for for example for metals and and also for other materials like non metals as well even polymers also have got crystallinity so different crystallographic orientation can be there and so that difference um, will also produce uh, difference in the friction and um, wear properties so for example um, graphite if you see the graphite has got is a hcp hexagonal close packed so if this is the basal plane <coughs> so these are the basal planes here and then it has got different layers so this is how the graphite is arranged <coughs> so if graphite is to be used the friction coefficient in this direction is very very low but friction coefficient in this direction is high so same same effect happens for other kinds of um, crystalline materials or materials which has got some um, arrangement of atoms in certain direction same thing happens for uh, graphene as well so that means for these kind of specialized applications we have to be uh, we have to ensure that our sliding surface or the friction surface is using the crystallographic plane which gives low coefficient of friction because otherwise it will not work 
and in fact this is very very important for a very uh, new area which is called uh, superlubricity that means um, superlubricity is basically a, a situation where the coefficient of friction is extremely low in a certain situation and and that corresponds to certain crystallographic orientation of the solid so if you change the crystallographic orientation of the solid then friction coefficient will will rise but in a particular crystallographic orientation the super lubricity effect will be there that means friction coefficient is extremely low so people are now trying to design uh, new solids with super lubricity effects so that we can um, reduce the use of lubricant altogether that means the solid itself can give us very low coefficient of friction uh, in homogeneity can also be in terms of different phases <coughs> um, so for example um, hbn or hexagonal boron nitride gives us very low coefficient of friction but other form of boron nitride may not give you low coefficient of friction so if you want to use boron nitride as a tribological material then it must be hexagonal boron nitride so these are all surface features which are very very important and an isotropy crystallographic uh, an isotropy which is similar in this sense but there is some anisotropy that means <coughs> it has got some directionality sir in case of super lubricity uh, it will be self lubricating uh, whether the grain orientation will be stable or not so a uh, grain orientation which will have lower amount of friction whether that grain orientation will be stable or not hmm. so uh, in order for super lubricity to work the orientation of the crystal crystal has to be of certain type so for example <clears throat> uh, i've got two surfaces so i have to slide one one over the other so this has got some uh, crystallographic orientation <clears throat> and this may have also certain crystallographic orientation so these two crystallographic orientation must be must have certain uh, features okay uh, one is called commensurate and another is incommensurate commensurate this basically means is that when these two crystallographic orientations are exactly same and they are matching with each other then it will give you high friction but if they they are making an angle so if they are incommensurate when it is commensurate means they are exactly the same for the these two surfaces and it is incommensurate when they are not exactly the same so in the incommensurate situation they give low coefficient of friction for certain uh, certain materials so this is the main uh, um, main method or main uh, direction of research to find out how can we design uh, solids for extremely low coefficient of friction so although theoretically it has been proved but practically uh, no such uh, we still don't have so much of handle of all these um, the crystallographic orientations of the surfaces so therefore we do not see in practical application 
we do not see this such kind of solids but perhaps in the future we may have this kind of superlubricity uh, solids which will give you very low coefficient of friction so the orientation of the uh, planes have to be decided by us and how we um, orient them only then we can achieve low coefficient of friction Another question, sir. Uh, whether uh, what I was asking is that whether the super lubricity will last for some period of time, or whether the grain orientation. Let's suppose we have oriented the grains uh, like commensurate uh, type, and after uh, uh, like it happens for a transient period of time or a very uh, less period of time, the where we get the super lubricity. If this will be the issue with this property, if Uh, in future if we get this property in practical situation so once we have aligned them in some way for example maybe by some other methods not necessarily mechanical way um so once we have aligned them in the most suitable direction uh, orientation then the friction will be extremely low i mean that is what the super lubricity means uh, it will be so low that there will be no more shear stress acting at that um, on the surface so that means that orientation will continue it will not change with time the orientation will change only if there is a wear taking place so perhaps it can remain that way for long time so but there will be some effect of thermal effect because of temperature the orientation may change the atoms may change their positions so there may be some long term effect but yes in the given uh, that use time of the bearing perhaps they will remain the same with low coefficient of friction and uh, very very low wear or maybe no wear situation yes sir but so far uh, no such uh, solid has been made so this is one uh, uh, active area of research and in fact that is how people are using uh, even graphene to in the hope that perhaps we can create a super lubricity uh, effect for graphene uh, because graphene is easier to handle <coughs> but we will see in the future so surface texture uh, surface texture is the repetitive or random deviation from the normal surface that forms the three dimensional topography of the surface so <coughs> so some repetitive uh, feature or some random deviation from the normal surface so normal surface may be for example i want a very very Uh, a surface which has got this kind of feature and it's very very smooth we want very smooth surface but the process of manufacturing may give us some roughness at different points in certain way it may be uh, directional it may be in certain direction so all these kind of features all put together are known as surface textures <coughs> so it includes uh, roughness <coughs> uh, like nano and micro roughness as well as macro roughness um, the waviness which we can call it macro roughness here and another type of surface texture is the lay and another is um, flaw or flaws so the roughness as we know it is made because of some fluctuations in the surface in the short wavelength so for example <clears throat> within a short uh, measurement let's say within 5 5 mm if i measure and there are some deviations from the mean so the mean is like this but the surface profile is changing from up and down from peaks and valleys so this will be considered as the roughness and this is in 
in 2D profile. But if we measure same thing in 3D, then it will give, give us peaks, different peaks on the surface. So this will be in the 3D. So these are produced by basically by uh, the production irregularities okay? or it also is the effect of some feed rate during the production process. So for example in the cutting process, machining process, turning and so on, uh, there will be some feed rate of the tool. So as we feed it will produce some sort of features and those features will come as the roughness and the waviness is something which has got bigger range so within a, a bigger range if we see some irregularities then it is the waviness so for example if we are measuring um, 10 centimeter and within 10 centimeter i see some some change in the surface profile so this will be known as the waviness so this is also a, a roughness but it is of the higher uh, wavelengths so the roughness is contained within this <clears throat> so the waviness can be uh, the result of some deflections in the machine or work piece because of deflections in the work piece <clears throat> it can also be a result of vibration during the manufacturing process or tool chatter <clears throat> or it can also be effect of some heat treatment or warping so all these kind of effect will lead to a, a change in the profile of the surface uh, which is which shows effect in a longer uh, sampling length. So for example, 10 centimeter or more. But when the sampling length is smaller within few millimeters and we see this kind of variation, then it is the roughness. <coughs> uh, lay is the, uh, the directional um, profile that we, we get because of the movement of the tool in certain direction. So for example, on the surface, um, during the grinding process, we can see that these kind of lines are formed, parallel lines or striations are formed. So this is kind of lay. <coughs> and flaws are some occasional um, issues. So on the surface, some occasional scratches, deep scratches can form or some gauze can form, some material has been removed. So these are flaws um, which are occasional. So this is how we separate the four types, the roughness, the waviness, lay and flaws. And all together these four will form the texture. So texture is a combination of many, many things together. And for any particular uh, application, we, we may not have to measure all of them. Okay. Sometimes we can um, measure roughness, sometimes we focus on the waviness, sometimes on the lay and flow. So it depends upon application where we are applying, but they will all have uh, influence on the travelogical performance. <coughs> 